Let us pray. Our Lord God, as we come to you this morning and, and opening your holy word, I ask, Lord, for your special help. I recognize, Lord, that these are spiritual words and that requires a spiritual mind and a heart that is transformed to understand it. I pray, Lord, that you may grant these things to those who hear. I pray that you would give us an ear to hear. I pray that these words would strengthen your people as they go out to war against the forces of darkness. Lord, help us to see the reality of the spiritual world and help us, Lord, not to be discouraged but help us to be emboldened by your truth as you present it in your word today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue on through Revelation, and we're getting into what I believe uh, myself are the exciting parts, I guess you'd call them. Uh, we are now at the point of the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'll look into that as we get further down and all that, that what that means. Uh, but just to give you a little bit of a background as to where we are and what we're, what we're doing, where we're going here, uh, we need to understand last week we looked at chapter 18, the, la the last half of 18, last two-thirds of chapter 18. And we saw uh, the fall of Babylon, and then we saw the three responses of the wicked to the fall of Babylon. Now Babylon, if you recall, represents the worldly system, the system that is organized by Satan to promote the world, the flesh, and the devil. And, and that is to drag down the people of God, to exalt Satan himself, to uh, discourage the people of God. All of these things uh, that, that this system is designed to do. And uh, we find that one of the things the system is designed to do is to kill the saints if, if it's able to. Now this system, Babylon, varies from age to age, but it's always been around ever since the very beginning of time as Satan has uh, entered into this world and, and he infiltrates and does what he needs to do to promote his kingdom. And his kingdom is always at war with the kingdom of God. And this is what Revelation is all about. It's the warfare the, between the two kingdoms. And uh, we're finding here what the end is going to be. Uh, one kingdom is going to triumph and the other will be completely and utterly destroyed. Now eventually, there, there's coming a time when this kingdom is going to culminate into the end time antichrist system, uh, which I believe is coming soon. I don't know when, uh, but uh, when that happens, uh, then these things are going to come crashing down and, and we're going to see the great work of God. Uh, we find that at the fall of Babylon, that the world was mourning. Uh, not because they cared for the system or the people in the world, but they were mourning over their own losses, their own social and economic losses. You had the kings of the earth mourning. Uh, they lose their power, their wealth, and their influence. The merchants, and we could put in parentheses, major corporations, uh, as well as, as others. Uh, they mourn over the, their loss of trade. No one buys their merchandise anymore. And we're given a long list of the merchandise. I think it's two verses there with a very, rather hefty sized verses describing the merchandise of these merchants. And it, which ends, we find, in the merchandising of the bodies and souls of men. And then we find the shipmasters. And they were those who specialized in trade and travel and made rich by the wealth of the system. They mourned as well. They even threw dust in the air. And the common explanation we find at the fall of this system by all of those who mourn was the quickness in which the judgment fell and all of this came to nothing. For one hour the judgment has come. We find that verse 9 and 17 and 19. And you think about uh, things falling quickly. You know, we've seen that before us so within the past week. Uh, Kabul in Afghanistan, how that you have one system in place uh, for 20 years and the power, the military power moves out, I think inadvisedly perhaps the way that they did it, uh, but uh, regardless of the politics there, we saw that another force came in quickly and everything just fell to the ground. That was uh, the 300, an army of 300,000 I think it was, with the very best military equipment in the world just collapsed and melted away and it was uh, it came to nothing. I think that's a, a, good, a good illustration of what we see here all in one hour. And verse 14 sums up the final end of all those who trust in worldly goods. 
of chapter 18, verse 14. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more. Uh, this we find was illustrated in uh, verses 21 through 23 by a mighty angel casting a great boulder like it was a millstone into the sea. You can imagine a millstone was a massive stone. You could throw it in, into the water, it would make a huge splash, but then the splash would be gone and you'd see that no more. And that's the description given to Babylon. Despite its great size, its power, it is swallowed up forever and forgotten. All the evidence of its existence disappears beneath the waves. And so it is with all the earthly benefits of this life uh, that people enjoy. Those who follow the Antichrist and care not for spiritual things and care not for eternal things. Everything comes crashing down and they lose it all as if in one hour and it's gone forever. All the joys of life that they could, they could possibly enjoy apart from God are gone eternally. And then we saw another reaction of the destruction of the great harlot. And that was in verse 20 and that is rejoicing. A voice comes from heaven. It's not, we're not told exactly how that occurred, but it, it says, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles, or we could also translate that, you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. So there's also a command given to rejoice. And there's two reasons for this command. One is that she deceived the nations. Babylon deceived the nations. She led the nations into immorality and idolatry. And she's gone. Rejoice over her because of that. And also because she was guilty of shedding the blood of the saints in verse 24. And we are then to rejoice. So the saints are commanded to rejoice in the destruction of this system. Uh, chapter 19 expands upon this rejoicing of the saints. Uh, we find uh, that we are transported, as we find frequently for Revelation, you're in one point and then you have another vision and you're transported somewhere else. Uh, John in chapter 18 is viewing the earth, what's happening on the earth. Babylon is falling. All of these people are mourning. And then we find chapter 19 the venue changes again and we are transported into heaven. We're now going to see this fall of the wicked world system from a heavenly viewpoint. And the chapter focuses upon the two main events of the coming of Christ. What's going to happen at the coming of Christ? Or what's commonly called the rapture. Now this is, uh, one is the calling up of his people and the other is the destruction of his enemies. You know, whenever you, you think of Christ's return, uh, there's this, just as you have with the destruction of Babylon, you have great sorrow and fear and trembling, and you have great rejoicing. It depends on who you are. And so we, we have here uh, the command uh, to, to rejoice with. For the first section deals primarily with that. Verse 19, if you'll take, or chapter 19, verse 1, if you'll take a look there. Uh, we have the rejoice and worship of the Lord for His just judgment. Verse 1, after these things, uh, we talked about that. Now we, we have the, uh, the previous vision. Uh, we're now moving on to another vision. This is a heavenly vision. And we find that this vision is of a great multitude. I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. Uh, so we're taken from earth to heaven. The destruction of the system of Babylon is what uh, has occurred. And the immorality, idolatry is, is uh, destroyed. And the saints in heaven, this great multitude now, are rejoicing as they were commanded to do. Uh, the saints and prophets and apostles suffered greatly at the hand of the beast. And what we're now witnessing is God's vengeance. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So now we see that. 
He, this has been reserved for him, and there's a reason it's reserved for him. First of all, uh, a corrupt human being would not be able to exact vengeance uh, properly as the, the Word of God would command vengeance to be exacted upon those who commit evil. You don't have all the facts. You would be clouded by your own corruption. Uh, we put those things in the hands of God. God says it's mine. Let me deal with it. And here we, we have it occurring. And uh, the saints, when they see this occur, they rejoice. You think about the great suffering that's going on right now in Afghanistan, the Christian converts who are suffering and dying at the hands of the satanic wicked Taliban, the, the, uh, those that are, that are energized by the satanic system that has been set up as false religion. These two who are suffering and dying right now will rejoice when God enacts His vengeance upon their persecutors. Look back, if you would, to chapter 7, as we've already covered several months ago now. Chapter 7 and verse 14. Now look at verse 13. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They came out of great tribulation. And there's a lot of discussion es eschatologically uh, over the great tribulation. Is Jesus coming before the tribulation or after the tribulation? Or is there an actual seven year tribulation? Or is the seven year tribulation something symbolic that will? perhaps get into some of that. Uh, but uh, it's only the Western world that really deals with these things because we've not had to go through tribulation as the rest of the world has. I mean, we did at one time, our, our, our forefathers went through tribulation, some of them, being flayed alive, having their skins removed off their bodies alive, being burned alive at the stake. Now, but we think of something, well, tribulation, well, that's something that's coming. Oh, it's all the time. In the world, you shall have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, says the Lord. You're going to have tribulation. We can see it all around us all the time. <clears throat> so this here, what we see is an answer to the prayer of the saints in chapter 6 and verse 10. How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge your blood on those who dwell on the earth? And here uh, we now see that. And as it occurs, we find the saints rejoicing. And we find them rejoicing. Uh, in the second part of verse 1, they're saying, this great multitude of saints is saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Now this is the only place, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that will find the word Alleluia or Hallelujah in the New Testament. It's actually a Hebrew term. Praise the Lord is what it means. You'll find it in Hebrew and all through the book of Psalms and the Old Testament. But here we have it transliterated as Alleluia. You know, I remember uh, several years ago now, uh, Christmas time, and the uh, Hallelujah Chorus, was, or what's a, the Handel's Messiah, was going to be at the uh, Heinz Hall. And it was a little expensive to get in, but I thought, one time in my life I want to go to see this uh, musical presentation at least one time in my life. So I saved up some money, uh, brought uh, Tammy and I think it was three of the kids at the time, but we couldn't have done it earlier. I couldn't afford to bring all the kids. We, you know, we had the, the seven and eight at home, nine at home, no, eight at home, and then uh, whatever. I, I get I lose track of the numbers, but but we were we were able to afford it. It was very expensive, but you get there and and you, you, and all of the, this this beautiful architecture, and they're singing, Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns, you know, and and I and just just the the music, and and there was people there that were just just overwhelmed by the music, uh, and I think it is, and, and a lot of these were Christian people as well. To, came to, to hear this. But this is this great worship of heaven. And you have this term, hallelujah, hallelujah, used four times in this part of the chapter. Uh, this is the only time in the New Testament. But it comes from the Old Testament, Psalm 113, verse 1. This is just one of the times. Praise the Lord. That's what it is. Hallelujah. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its going down. The Lord's name is to be praised. So we have this word, Alleluia, being shouted out. Praise the Lord. And we have the elements of the praise. Salvation, glory, honor, and power belong to the Lord our God. Salvation in that He is the only Savior. He delivers from the bondage of this world to heavenly glory. He provides the victory that we need over our enemies that we cannot do ourselves. And glory, His glory, uh, the glory of His person is so great that those who view it are blinded. You think of Saul who saw the glory of Christ. Uh, who became the Apostle Paul, and how his eyes were blinded at the sight of the glory of Christ. He is glorious above all. Honor, that is, he is due all respect and reverence, and power. His might is unstoppable. When he decides to deliver from the hand of a Pharaoh or whoever, then that deliverance is going to occur. Nothing can get in his way. Nothing can stop. And as we're going to see as we progress, he is all powerful. So we praise Him uh, for his, his greatness, for all of these things. And we also praise Him in verse 19, verse 2, for true and righteous are His judgments. His judgments are true, that is, they are genuine, they are, genuine. Uh, they are based on reality, they're not clouded by corrupt human reasoning, but they are true. The, they, if you try to think of something that's true in the sense that uh, you, can, you can cut a line, but you want to cut a straight line or a true line. His judgments are completely straight and true. And they are righteous. And the word righteous there is just. Or that there is none that can find any fault in the uh, judicial approval of His judgments. Not as the unjust judges who corrupt judgment, either by the basis of their ideology or because of gifts or bribes. Uh, judges sometimes will give unjust uh, uh, judge, uh, judgments. Not so with the Lord. His judgments are always righteous, and we praise Him for that. Uh, this is uh, one of the great principles of Scripture. Only the Lord has the ability to exact pure justice upon the offenders. Now, He has set up in this world a, a system of governments to exact justice upon the ungodly, those who commit crimes. But as we see, uh, th th these are fallible. You know, we find people committing crimes who just walk away scot-free. And then there's others who don't even commit a crime but are abused by, this, by an ungodly system. Not so with the Lord. His justice is perfect. His justice is not to be questioned. Men are prone to question His judgment. Usually they ascribe to God cruelty for what is viewed as excessive judgment. Now, I remember watching a segment of a question and answer session that included R.C. Sproul and a panel of other men. And a question came up. The question was, why do you think that, that such a harsh judgment was placed upon man for such, the, such a minor offense as not eating a piece of fruit? Now, the, God was so harsh in doling out death to man just for the eating of a piece of fruit. That doesn't seem right. Now, if you're familiar with R.C. Sproul, R.C. Sproul uh, got up and said, What's wrong with you people? <laughs> Don't you understand? How long do we have to teach you about the holiness of God and about the corruption of man? Don't you get this? How holy and righteous He is. There is no such thing as a little sin in the eyes of God. One sin is enough to bring upon the, the mighty wrath and just judgments of God. And all of us, of course, are guilty of at least that one sin. And our minds are corrupted. We don't see it. But His, ju His judgments are always pure and just and perfectly right. Genesis chapter 18, verse 25. We, talk, we, we, we look at, at Abram and the judgment that's coming on Sodom. And the Lord comes with two angels and tells Abraham. He sends the angels off to do what, what they've come for, to destroy Sodom. And he communes with Abraham. I think it was Abram at the time. And tells him what's going to happen. And Abraham says, Lord, if there's 50 righteous people, will you spare the city? Yes, I will. 
If there's 40, if there's 30, if there's 20, and if there's 10, yes, I'll spare the city if I find 10 righteous people. But of course, you know that that wasn't the case. There's one righteous man there, it was Lot. The city was destroyed. But Abraham pleaded with God, and he said, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And he does. The judge of all the earth, the Lord God, will do right. And when he exacts his judgments, then we are to rejoice. And we, whenever this happens in the end time, in the system, it comes crashing down, and, and we see that. We're going to see more of this as, as we progress. So these judgments we find in verse 2. Because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Here we have this all over again. This is repeated several times throughout the book. This judgment, he has judged the great harlot. He judged her for her moral corruption. We've already seen, we've talked about this, how this occurs. Satan usurps the authority of governmental power or social power, economic power, and he uses it to promote wickedness. He makes good evil and evil good. That's, that's his specialty, and he does so. Uh, this harlot, this system has corrupted the earth. And we've seen in the West the demonic philosophies promoting the lust of the flesh, and even to the point of unnatural impulses, which bring upon the wrath of God, we find in Romans chapter 1. We've also seen it in other places in the world, in Islam, which I've already mentioned, that in the name of religion, you have polygamy, you have slavery, you have even sodomy. Now you think about uh, uh, how, how strict these, these imams are in Islam and, and the Islamic people that you've got to live a certain way and women you have to cover your faces and you have blah, 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 blah and they have all these strict rules. Yet you find it in practice. It's a very wicked system. Now I, I have a, a son who served there and t tells me some of these things but I saw a story of, of one, uh, one fellow that was trying to train uh, an a Afghani officers he had to reprimand one of his Afghani officers for raping a private. Uh, it's uh, sodomizing a private. This is going on in this religion, which is so careful to, to cross all the I's and jot, no, dot all the I's and cross all the T's of their rules. But you find all of this wickedness bubbling up, and there's more and more and more of it. Satan is the one who enacts such things, and God takes note of the mistreatment of his people and the persecution of his people. And he avenges on her not only the immor immorality that she brings, but the blood of his servants that she has shed. Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you, that is the Israelites. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Touching the apple of God's eye, that is, to touch the pupil of the eye. That's the one place that, you know, a person can, some people don't like to be touched at all. You know, I'm not one that's real touchy, you know, feely kind of a guy. But, but uh, I don't mind someone putting their shoulder, you know, hand on my shoulder or something like that, or pat me on the back, a handshake, maybe an occasional hug, you know, whatever. But, but uh, there's other, other people real, real touchy. But if, if someone walks up to you and they go to touch you in the pupil of the eye, everybody in this room is going to back up and say, whoa. <laughs> You're going to, it's, going to, it's going to bring a reaction. You know, and so that's what, what the Lord is saying here. To touch his people is to touch the pupil of his eye. There's going to be a reaction. And as the system has shed the blood of his people, he is going to react accordingly. And he does. We find in verse 3. Again, they said, Alleluia. Here we have the second Alleluia. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And here we have a crying out of Alleluia. We, we sing Alleluia for the blood of Christ, what He has done for us. We sing for the, the glory of God, His greatness, His holiness. But here we have a, a crowd singing, the, the, the multitude of saints singing for the eternal destruction of the ungodly. What a, it almost makes us you know, think, what, you're singing for the smoke of her torment that is ascending forever, the eternal torment of the enemies of God that rises up forever 
and ever. We're going to see that this aspect of God's fearsome wrath is described multiple times throughout the rest of this book. We're going to see this eternal judgment of God being enacted upon His enemies. Remember, we're at the end. Mercy is done. It's gone. If there is any time for mercy, it is now past, and the wrath of God has fallen. And God is enacting upon the ungodly their just wrath, and the people of God rejoice. You know, we think about the eternal destruction of the ungodly, and it's a fearful and, and, and horrible thing to contem contemplate. But it is something that the Scriptures teach. There is the idea today of trying to overlook this, this uh, eternal judgment. But it's something that we find in the Scripture, something that is taught by the Lord Jesus Himself. Matthew 8, verse 11. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mark chapter 9, verse 43. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, it's Gehenna, into the fire that shall never be quenched. And no matter, well, the, the, rather, the, the, the more that the world departs from the word, drifts away from the truth, the more they try to cover up this fact of eternal punishment. Now, we do not like to discuss the idea of eternal punishment. It's not pleasant, but it's true. And we must not overlook it. You know, and I, and I find that even in portions of what used to be fundamentalism, or even some Reformed people, or evangelical people, are be beginning to question the eternal punishment of the damned. You know, that, oh, the, surely God won't do that. Surely there, there must be a, a time limit on the punishment of sin. Folks, that's not what the Bible teaches. They're going to twist the Scriptures, and they're going to follow after the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists and others who deny the eternal punishment of the wicked, that the wicked will simply be burned up as you would burn up a stick, and it's gone, and turns into ash, and that's it. And so, but that's not what the Bible teaches. This is human reasoning. It is not scriptural exegesis. As the saints observe this eternal smoke, her smoke, the smoke of the harlot, the, those who are involved in the system, the smoke that's coming up from their eternal torment, the saints rejoice. So we find something that's very odd for us to try to comprehend, but that's what we find here. And verse 4. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. So we have, once again, we have the Alleluia, the third one. And this we have a repeat of the, the, of, of the time, if you remember, uh, when the, the, whenever the scroll was being presented in heaven, and no one is found worthy to open the scroll. Who's, no one, who's going to take the scroll and open up the scroll? And no one was found worthy. And John was, was looking at this situation, began to weep because no one was worthy. And he stopped and, 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 and uh, the, uh, uh, one of the elders said, no, wait a minute, there, the Lamb, He's worthy. And the scroll was given to the Lamb of God. And as the scroll was handed over from the Father to the Son, they fall down and worship the Father and the Son. We have the same thing here. As we have this smoke of the torment coming up, they fall down and worship God. You know, and I think one of the things that ought to drive us to worship is recognizing that what, what we should be, where we should go. Now, we should be under the wrath of God. We should be destined for eternal torment. We all deserve that, and justly so. But... We rejoice when we think about the greatness and love of God, how wonderful it is that the Son has come and provided for us the means by which we're able to avoid this horrible place. And that's per perhaps, I believe, is what's going on here. These saints fall down and worship God. 
and sing, Alleluia, praise ye the Lord. And the holy angels fall down with them and the saints together. And then we have another call, verse 5. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. So we have a call to come out to praise God for all the saints. We have this great chorus. The worship continues to build. And then we look to verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as, and as the sound of mighty thundering saying Alleluia. And there we have, I believe, is our fourth Alleluia. Praise ye the Lord. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. So we have this great crescendo of worship once again. You have people being added to the worship and you have them proclaiming uh, praise for the omnipotence of God. God is all-powerful. As we're on earth and we have suffered under the hands of the beast, the harlot, the, 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 the false prophet and all of them, we've endured all of this. And the end comes and Christ returns and destruction falls upon them. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. He is the one who has the power to bring all of these things to a just end. And that word omnipotent is he who is almighty. There's no questioning his power. He can do whatever he wishes to do. And he puts all of his enemies under his feet. He has the power to debase his enemies. He has the power to exalt his people. And that is what he does. And we go to the next section in verse, nine, verse 7. And, and let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. So we have here this rejoicing at the marriage of the Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let us rejoice and be glad. You know, this is something, it's sometimes difficult to really instill in the people of God, but worship is to be a time of rejoicing. You know, we come with a mix of sorrow and rejoicing. We come because of the sorrow of our sin and our failures. We go into the presence of God, but yet, yet we rejoice because of what He has done for us, what He has provided for us. You know, I, I think that, that we need to keep that in mind when we're singing, when we're praying, when we praise. You know, to, to give yourself over to it. I'm not talking about the false stuff that you'll see on TV or if you've been in some of these churches where people have to drum it up. Let's be happy. You know, I've been in some of these services. Okay, we come in, we're tired throughout the week, we've been through a lot. Uh, some of us have suffered some things and we're, we're, just, we're just not all prepared. And let's all be happy, everybody. And then we'll sing songs. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the songs we used to sing. It's probably best I don't anyway. Uh, but, but let's get happy, happy, and happy. You know, that, that's not what we're talking about. You know, trying to drum up you know, this, this false sense of joy. But there ought to be a true sense of joy in thinking about what God has done for us. You know, what joy there is in Christ. You know, and, and uh, I remember first becoming a believer and first getting the, fir the, 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 the kind of like the surface understanding of what's happened. You know, because I, I had a basic understanding, but not as I do now 45 years later. And I'm thinking, okay, what has happened to me for 44 years? Uh, and I'm telling my friends, I was joyful in this. Jesus has saved me. My sins, which I deserve to go to hell, I don't, I'm not going there anymore. Not because I don't deserve it, but because of what Jesus has done. And I remember going to them, and, and then they're going, oh, oh, okay, okay. And then you find out word gets around, Jeff's got religion. Oh. This is in high school, you know, and I think it was like 11th grade. And they, they don't understand what's wrong. But the saints ought to understand that. We enter into the presence of God. It ought to be a time of great rejoicing because of what He has done. We rejoice and we're glad. Uh, Psalm 40, verse 16. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. There's a great joy in it. The world's not going to understand that. But the God's people ought to have it in their heart. Their hearts ought to be bubbling over with this joy of God and the presence of God. In Solomon's prayer of dedication, Now therefore arise, O Lord God, to, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. 
Let your priests, O Lord, be clothed with salvation, and let your saints rejoice in goodness. It is a great honor to be admitted into the presence of God, to be a partaker of the righteousness of Christ and the object of of His redeeming love, this work on the cross, to be the object of that. And as we enter into His presence, there ought to be that joy. Lord, thank You. I don't deserve to be here. Of all people on the earth, I don't deserve to be here, but You have chosen me. You have called me. You have brought me into Your presence. What joy there ought to be. And when does this occur here? This is occurring at the marriage supper of the Lamb, the marriage of the Lamb. Let us rejoice, let us glad and rejoice. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His wife has made herself ready. Uh, this, this is the rapture of the saints, what is called the rapture of the saints. I have to be careful using the terminology because there's a lot involved in some, some of that which I, I don't care for. But, but we have this idea of, of the Lord coming and calling up of His saints. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. The, his wife, the Lord's wife, has made herself ready in verse 7. She, by, through faith, has endured all the hardship of the world and sought to purify herself from wicked works through the power of the Holy Spirit, through maintaining good works, through the, the, the Word of God. She has done all that. But this is not accomplished through human effort. Verse 8, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So we're given this. It's not something we produce from within ourselves. We're given this, the righteous acts of the saints. How are we given that? Through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is now implanted in our hearts. And it's through the work of the Spirit and the Word of God that these righteous acts proceed. If they don't proceed, we can step back and say, uh, do I really have the Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit going to do that? He's going to strengthen you in truth and guide you in truth and convict, convict you of, of righteousness and produce in you a life of holiness. And we, we <coughs> excuse me. So this is given to the saints. And this is a great, and the greatest blessing of all is to be called to the married supper of the Lamb. Take a look at verse 9. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So he says this. There's, this is a blessing. If you are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, you are blessed. And he says to John, Write this down. If you're called, you're blessed. Think of all those who haven't been called. Think of those on the other side of the world or even in our own country who, who either have no concern for it or have no, not heard the word. We're to rejoice that we're called. And John said, John was told to write this down. All that we can get out of this life, think of, I mean, think of the wonderful things of life, the adventures that you can go in life, things you can do, the joys of life, the accomplishments that you, that, that you can be a part of, uh, the wealth that you can enjoy. But this alone is, uh, these things alone are not the goal. It's this one thing which means to be eternally blessed. And that is to be called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Take a look real quick to Luke chapter 14 if you would. Turn back to Luke chapter 14. We have this call. There's a warning given here. The Lord has been very gracious to sinful men. And you think of all the horrible things that men have done. They denied that God even exists. They'll blaspheme His holy name. And I remember turning on something, I forget what it was, and just the Lord Jesus, His name is being used and abused just time and time. I shut the thing off immediately. These people don't know the Lord. Why are they doing this? Yet the Lord calls them. Take a look, verse 15 of chapter 14. Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, that is Jesus said, 
A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, became, uh, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you have commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. You know, whenever the invitation goes out to come to the supper, uh, it is wise to heed that invitation. You know, for uh, the, the Lord eventually closes that door and none of them will taste of that supper. What a horrendous thing to reject the invitation uh, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And finally, verse 10, Revelation chapter 19. We won't have time to get into it heavily. But John falls down before this angel and the angel says to him, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You know, you think of after all of this worship that we've seen and the praise of God, in the first part of the chapter, we're taught a lesson here. And that is that we are to worship none but God. No angels, no saints, nobody. No one but God is worthy of of our worship. Romans chapter 123 warns us of man's propensity to descend into a judge into a uh, worship that involves the creature rather than the creator. We're to focus upon the creator. Don't do it. Don't don't uh, worship anything but the Lord Jesus, a God, the, the Trinity. Worship God. He alone is worthy of our adoration. This angel was a mere messenger. Uh, the uh, his messenger of Jesus. Jesus is to receive all of the glory. So the question is, do you worship Jesus Christ? Is the service of God your top priority? Or do you allow the mundane things of this life to steal the glory that belongs only to Him? Let us bow for prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, Lord, what a wonderful thing it is to know You. And Lord, we rejoice that we have been granted that privilege of knowing you. Lord, you have put us where we are that we can hear the word. You have inclined our hearts and minds to hear and understand. And Lord, we rejoice that you have done so. We know that you've done so not because of any good in us. But we are all wicked, all evil. But Lord, you've granted to us mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ and we rejoice in him. I pray that you would use this message as it's been preached to do the work which you desire to do in each heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.